previous class uh, we were looking into the topic uh, that uh, covers basically uh, dependence on the initial data and we also mentioned one theorem where we learned that if you uh, perturb the initial condition as well as um, the right hand side I mean you can perturb either one of them or you can perturb both of them then um, how uh, the actual solution uh, deviates from the uh, perturbed solution right. So, that was the theorem that we uh, wanted to address. Uh, I will show you one or two examples where we actually um, verify this theorem right and uh, we will see um, how changing this uh, initial condition uh, by some by one example one or two examples uh, affects the solution right. So, we will start today's lecture with um, one example all right. Suppose let me write example 1. So, we consider the following problem, we consider the initial value problem IVP initial value problem uh, um, x dot equals to A of x um, and uh, x at 0. So, this is basically your dx dt equals to A of x and uh, x at 0 is equals to we will take 1. So, let us call it as equation number 1 this one is equation number 2 ok. And the perturbed problem perturbed uh, initial value problem IVP uh, y dot equals to a y. So, basically this problem d y d t equals to a y this is equation number 3 and uh, we perturb the initial condition y at 0 as uh, 1 plus epsilon. So, basically the problem is valid uh, for t greater than 0 right and at t is equals to 0 we have uh, x 0 as 1 whereas the initial condition is uh, 1 plus epsilon. So, epsilon you can say any arbitrary small number and uh, for the time being we are not perturbing the right hand side. So, right hand side we are keeping uh, as it is the same expression uh, whereas um, the initial condition has been changed. So, then what will happen? So, you can write uh, the vector field just a small note the vector field that means uh, the right hand side is unperturbed or unperturbed or you can say not perturbed right i e that is uh, r t x just like previous theorem is taken to be 0. So, then uh, here we have uh, f if you visualize in this fashion f of t comma uh, p let us say uh, then this is uh, a y uh, a p and this implies that uh, mod of f of t p minus f of t q is uh, basically a p minus a q. So, this is less than or equal to mod of a p minus q and this tells you this gives the Lipschitz constant this gives the Lipschitz constant as L equals to mod of A right very straightforward to see what is our Lipschitz constant here ok. Now, uh, if you solve uh, the equation 1 uh, if you solve the equation 1 using the initial condition 2. So, we if, um, we can solve we can solve 1 to 2 and the perturbed problem 3 to uh, 4 and the solution is given by. So, I will show you only for equation 1 and uh, for equation 2 it is analogous is given by. So, dx dt 
equals to a of x right a of x. So, from here you can divide by x and uh, this will become d x by x equals to a d t. We can integrate both sides. So, this will become log of x of course, to the base c minus log of c to the base c equals to a t. So, this will imply uh, x equals to c into e to the power a t. Now, you can use um, initial condition. So, at t is equals to 0 x is 1. Let us call this as equation number 5. So, at t equals to 0 we have x uh, t or x 0 is equals to 1. So, uh, we will get if you substitute the value we will get uh, c equals to 1 uh, and this implies this implies x t is equals to e to the power a t. This is equation number 6. So, um, you can say that the solution is for the, for the first equation 1 to 2 I mean the first initial value problem 1 to 2 it is x e to the power a t. Now, let us go to the uh, we can similarly write the solution of 3 to 4 and y t will become 1 plus epsilon e to the power a t. This is relation number I believe uh, 7 ok. So, this is relation number 7. Now, let us go back to the previous theorem. So, previous theorem said that we can um, approx I mean we can find out the deviation basically how much it differs uh, the perturbed solution and the um, unperturbed solution that means x t how much it differs from y t that we can find out by taking the mod on uh, x t minus y t. So, we will do the same thing here. So, if I do um, um, so from previous theorem I am just calling it previous theorem, but you can uh, look into the lecture uh, previous lecture and you uh, you can mention that theorem here. So, from previous theorem we obtain what do we obtain? We can write mod of since we have only a scalar equation you can use mod. If we have a vector equation then we will use that Euclidean norm that is uh, two standing lines on both sides ok. So, mod of y t minus x t will become uh, mod of 1 plus epsilon e to the power a t uh, minus uh, what was x t? x t was simply e to the power a t all right. So, this will become uh, less than or equal. So, 1 e to the power a t will get cancelled. So, this will become mod of epsilon uh, mod of e to the power a t. Since we do not know the sign of a. So, we do not know whether a is uh, um, positive or negative. So, we will simply write this is less than or equal to mod of epsilon uh, e to the power mod of t right ok. Now, here uh, basically uh, we have to know what is the sign of a right. So, it is we see that we see that uh, from previous theorem previous theorem um, uh, from previous theorem the estimate for norm of y t minus x t is very accurate for A is positive, but um, very inaccurate for A is negative. For example, we can see this we can see this in below figure. So, what does this mean? Let us look at the figure. So, we have uh, x axis uh, sorry t axis 
So we have t axis and we have x axis. Okay. So x axis or y axis you can say uh, because uh, we will plot we will plot y t and we will plot x t. So this is somewhere we have one and uh, this is somewhere we have one plus epsilon. Right. So at x equals to zero, it will be um, one, and at and uh, sorry, at t is equals to zero, it will be x equals to one, and at t is equals to zero, it will be y as uh, one plus epsilon. So when a is positive, then what will happen? This will go like this, and uh, this will go like this. Right. So this is e to the power a t when a is positive. Right. So it will continuously grow exponentially. So, this is our 1 plus epsilon e to the power a t right. Whereas, um, when a is less than 0. So, then what will happen? It will start from e to the power 1 plus epsilon and then it will continuously decline. So, this is our uh, uh, this is our e to the power a t when a is less than 0. And this one also decline uh, one plus epsilon e to the power eighty, right? So basically, what is happening is. Um, if it starts uh, at uh, t is equal to, I, I think I have to have written uh, upside down. So, this should be e to the power a t and this should be 1 plus epsilon e to the power a t. So, it is starts at t is equal to, it starts from 1 plus epsilon when a is less than 0 and then it is continuously declining and uh, here it starts at when a is less than 0 then uh, uh, then it will start at t is equal to 0 it will start at uh, um, the x t graph it will start at 1 and then it will keep on going down. So, here we can see that if, if I go back to the statement uh, the according to the statement uh, we have seen that norm of y t minus x t is less than or equal to uh, e to the power capital L t minus t 0 norm of y 0 minus x 0 plus capital M by L uh, e to the power L t minus t 0 minus 1 right and it tells us that uh, the two solutions which are close at t is equals to t 0 may diverge exponentially however small the perturbation is right. So, even though if you have added a little bit um, a, a positive quantity let us say or negative does not matter. If you have added little bit into the initial condition, but because of that uh, perturbation in the initial condition according to that theorem, it tells us that the two solutions may diverge exponentially however small the perturbation is right. And uh, so, when A is positive it is actually agreeing with that theorem right, but uh, when a is negative, then we can see in this graph that the solutions are getting closer to one another because when your uh, t tends to infinity, then basically a is less than 0. So, then what will happen is uh, your exponential will uh, uh, try uh, will, will, will go towards 0 and therefore, your uh, y t minus x t will actually become um, same. So, here um, that criteria for that I mean the conclusion of that theorem is not satisfied. So, that is why we are saying that uh, this y t minus x t this difference is very accurate I mean it, it, it agrees with the uh, statement of the theorem when your a is positive because when a is positive they are actually diverging to exponentially and far away from each other when a is less than 0 then it is basically not giving us the conclusion of that theorem. So, therefore, it is very inaccurate that does not mean that the a priori estimate that we have obtained or mentioned in the previous class is uh, not useful. It is useful uh, on several occasions, it is just that uh, this is one particular example where we can see that how um, uh, the behavior of this uh, a priori estimate uh, can change depending upon what values of A you are choosing, right. So, um, 
this is uh, that result ok. Um, basically, uh, by this example, we were uh, we saw that uh, that the estimates or the inequality that we obtain may yield highly inaccurate results. Um, however, the inequality uh, of this uh, upper uh, the upper estimate or inequality is still very useful and uh, will be applied at uh, uh, several occasions. So, we will see when we study uh, some other topics in this lecture. Um, basically, uh, here we are also trying to uh, obtain the maximum time in time interval during which x t remains in the given neighborhood of the initial condition right. So, with the help of this theorem we can also determine x t the, the maximum uh, interval um, in which uh, x t try to remain in the neighborhood of x 0 right. And uh, to investigate this uh, we uh, we can state a small theorem. So, let us say uh, let us take omega r uh, omega r is equals to all such x such that norm of x minus x 0 is less than or equal to some r positive right around x 0. So, that is the um, uh, that is the that is the ball uh, let us take here you can write let us take the ball of course, it is a ball and uh, around the point x 0 and uh, uh, we ask for a capital T right. We ask for a capital T such that x T still remains in this omega r. So, this is basically we are talking about a maximum time time interval. So, ob obviously that maximum time time interval will be a subset of capital I. So, capital I is where the whole problem whole uh, initial value problem is defined. But uh, since beginning we are saying that local existence global existence global existence and all that. So, when we are asking that uh, the solution x t will remain in the neighborhood of the point x 0. Um, then the time interval will always be a subset of this capital I. So, we are looking for what is that maximum time interval? What is the maximum t 0 to capital T uh, which is the subset of capital I such that the solution x t will remain inside this ball. So, that is that is the capital T we are asking for right uh, for all you can write for all t small t in capital T uh, small t 0 to capital T. So, to answer this question we take to answer this question we take r is equals to minus of f and uh, z0 equals to 0 in our previous theorem in our previous theorem. So, the corresponding because the previous theorem was about um, our y t minus uh, uh, x t the estimate of um, the, the estimate of that by taking the norm. So, in this in that problem we are now taking r equals to minus of f that means, uh, uh, the, the perturbed problem is uh, basically where we have added an r we are taking minus of f and we are taking z 0 equals to 0. So, then uh, y t will become x 0 and uh, we obtain a special case a special case of the previous theorem of the previous theorem. Let me just quickly give you a recap of what was the previous theorem was about. So, in the previous theorem we had this problem we had uh, d x d t d x d t equals to uh, f of t comma x and we had x at 0 is equals to x 0 x at 0 or x at t 0 
t0 I think I have written ok and then and we had a dy dt is equals to we did the perturb, uh, perturbation and uh, we wrote uh, f of t y plus r t y um, and uh, y at t 0 is equals to x 0 plus z 0 right. This is what we had and then we were able to obtain an priori estimate of this type uh, norm of. So, the conclusion was norm of y t minus x t norm is less than or equal to e to the power capital L t minus t 0 uh, norm of y 0 minus of x 0 plus capital M by L if we assume it to be bounded then this e to the power capital L t minus t 0 minus of 1. So, in this theorem we are taking r equals to minus of f then our dy dt will become uh, 0 and if you take z 0 equals to 0 then basically what we will get is dy dt uh, then we what I mean. So, from here we will get dy dt um, is equals to uh, I am putting r equals to minus of f. So, this will become 0 and y at t 0 will become x 0 because we are substituting z 0 equals to 0. So, from here obviously, the solution will be y t equals to x 0 right. So, this is what we are saying. So, basically uh, if we do all these things, if we do this, this then in our uh, previous theorem. Uh, this particular equation will yield the solution this and therefore, we can state now uh, a modified version of the previous theorem that is uh, we can call you can call the previous theorem as 2 uh, as 1. So, this one will be theorem 2. So, theorem 2 is if x is a solution of the initial value problem x dash or x dot equals to f of t comma x and uh, x t at 0 is equals to x 0. Uh, if uh, if the solution uh, if uh, x is a solution of this existing existing uh, on I will write it as uh, capital achha, capital I for the global. So, let us write J just to use a different notation existing on J uh, cross R n with J is equals to T 0 to T 0 plus T. Then norm of x t minus x 0 is less than or equal to integral from t 0 to t norm of f of s y of s any x of s sorry uh, x of s uh, e to the power capital L t minus t 0 t minus uh, t 0 as from t 0 we are integrating. So, t to s basically uh, uh, t minus s d of s uh, this I can correct t minus right. So, this is this is a basic inequality for this uh, let us call it as uh, since it is theorem, theorem 2 I can call the equation or inequality 2.1. So, inequality 2.1 um, we have uh, ellipse here I have to put a norm. So, uh, f of s comma uh, x 0 uh, t 2 t 0 uh, x comma x uh, x 0 norm. Uh, f of s comma x 0 uh, x 0 uh, let me write it afresh uh, f of s comma x 0 something is not coming correct. Uh, let me try again. Hmm. 
So, this should be x 0 uh, something is not coming correctly. Uh, All right. So, then basically uh, we have norm of x t minus x 0 is less than or equal to integral from t 0 to t norm of f of s x 0 uh, into e to the power l uh, t minus s d of s. So, this is basically coming from uh, our uh, uh, previous theorem that we um, stated uh, in the previous class. So, theorem 1 you can say. So, here uh, the Lipschitz constant uh, in this inequality 2.1 the Lipschitz const, uh, con constant L and the vector field at x 0 apparently provide enough information to uh, obtain upper bound. Obviously, because uh, here as we can see uh, basically uh, this part is easy to obtain because uh, if you look at the previous theorem. So, there we had uh, um, there we had norm of uh, the, there we had norm of uh, f and uh, from there you can write uh, norm of uh, f times uh, 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 norm of f minus uh, f of s comma um, x s minus f of x comma x 0 plus f of x comma x 0. So, from there we will obtain the Lipschitz constant and uh, the basically we will obtain uh, uh, this part right. So, we will obtain this part. Uh, this here and the Lipschitz constant L uh, will actually tell us uh, the Lipschitz constant L will actually tells us that uh, uh, and this uh, norm of f of s at x 0 um, actually tells us what will be the upper bound because from here what we can do we can write uh, this uh, inequality as uh, norm of um, x 0 plus integral this uh, is less than or equal to x t less than or equal to norm of x 0 plus this integral right. So, basically what what I am saying is that uh, if you have a uh, mod of x t uh, minus x 0 um, let us say norm is less than or equal to some constant c. So, from here I can write uh, c um, not c 0 I can write c. Uh, minus norm of x 0 uh, less than or equal to norm of x t um, less than or equal to uh, c plus norm of uh, x t uh, no, sorry norm of x 0 right something like that. So, this way we can bound. So, basically uh, from so, so this is something that we want to do. So, from 2.1 from 2.1 uh, we find that we find that x t x t is obviously in between somewhere. So, you have x 0 and uh, you have small c with um, in the I mean before. So, basically c minus norm of x 0 that is somewhere before norm of x 0 and uh, c plus norm of x 0 after x 0. So, you have a small neighborhood or a small ball in which x t is always there. Now, what is the radius of that ball? We can write it down. Uh, so, that is what I am trying to do. So, from here I can say that x t is always in that uh, omega r right. Now, how we define this r as long as as long as t 0 is uh, as long as t as long as uh, t uh, is in that uh, t 0 to capital T with T is equals to T of R where we have um, integral from 0 to, uh, t 0 to t norm of f of s comma x 0 e to the power l t minus s d s. Now, if you integrate so this this is this we can show that uh, it is uh, um, we have a priori information about f. So, this is bounded and here this exponential if, uh, if we integrate with respect to s and substitute the value. So, that exponential will also become bounded because this t is going up to capital T. So, ultimately this entire quantity will be finite and I am writing it as some constant r r or some other letter whichever you want to use. Uh, 
So, this value is r and uh, from here basically uh, we can say that uh, there is a small neighborhood. So, this capital R actually depends upon this capital uh, T. So, the, uh, so, sorry this capital T is actually it depends upon this capital R. So, um, we cannot have the rate I mean the radius of the ball cannot be uh, cannot be very large. So, obviously within the point uh, x 0 initial point x 0 there will be a small ball or small neighborhood where the solution will always belong right. So, this is what we are trying to say via this theorem and uh, here basically um, if we take the Lipschitz constant uh, L. Um, corresponding to uh, if we take the uh, we may take the Lipschitz constant L corresponding to f uh, belonging to Lip, uh, set of I mean f is always a Lipschitz constant a continuous function and uh, therefore, we have the information that uh, x t will belong to in some neighborhood of x 0 right. So, this particular result tells us that whenever we talk about local existence what will be that local I mean the, the interval of existence for that local solution. So, by this theorem at least we are uh, we can guarantee that uh, if our function is uh, the right hand side is Lipschitz continuous then there will be a, a small neighborhood or small ball around the point x 0 where the solution will always exist and uh, that uh, radius of that uh, ball or neighborhood can be determined uh, by uh, uh, using this particular theorem. So, there are several results that are actually connecting to the existence of solutions. So, we have um, continuous function on the right hand side. So, you have a local, uh, local existence at least one solution. If you have Lipschitz continuous function then you have local solution plus uniqueness. Now, uh, there are global existence theorem which we stated in the previous classes. Now, here we have continuous dependence on the initial data and not only that uh, this particular theorem also tells you that if you have a local existence, if your f is Lipschitz continuous then you have a unique local existence. Now, what will be that interval? That interval is basically a small subset of your original i and uh, it is somewhere a neighborhood of that point x 0 of the initial condition right. So, once you have that uh, existence around the initial condition then you may think of uh, doing the global uh, existence and all that. So, those are separate topics again, but we did cover in the first chapter itself. Now, um, I wanted to explain one or two more examples, uh, but we will do it in the next class. So, we will keep this theorem to uh, handy and we will start with one example from this particular uh, theorem and uh, we will continue our discussion then. So, thank you for your attention and I will see you in the next class.